Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to The Move. I'm your host, Lance Armstrong. I have, I'm sitting in Colorado. I have to my uh, right, uh, Mr. George Hincapi over in Greenville, South Carolina. To sort of below me, I have Mr. J.B. Hager in Austin, Texas. And somewhere even further right, the other J.B., Johan Brunil. Um, this seven shows of, of the move, let me just give you a little background and context. So we've, as we all know, the month of July, which for a hundred years has hosted and held the Grand Boucle, the Tour de France. We're living in a crazy time. Sports are not uh, as they once were for the time being. Um, and so we, we, we too, as fans are, are a little starved for content and for um, action. And so what we've decided to do is with this crew to put together a little seven episode package, the best of the blue train, all of our best memories, plus all of the, um, some of the days that you guys weighed in, you guys and gals, and told us that you wanted to see. Um, these seven shows are brought to you in conjunction with our good friends at PowerDot, who have a really killer Strava challenge going on right now. It's got, last I checked, over a couple hundred thousand people signed up. Uh, we'll have some of their friends and, uh, and supporters on the show for these seven days. Um, but we're just going to go through and, and, and sort of cover, really, in chronological order, cover some of our seven most memorable days. And so starting with today... Uh, we're going to really kind of touch on two days. We'll touch on the prologue in 1999, touch on the very next day, one of the most epic stages that we've ever seen, uh, the Passage du Gois, which we'll get into to the specifics of that. And then almost a little less than a week later, the first time trial, which again, we can get into uh, just what that meant for all of us. And so um, that'll kick us off. We got seven of these shows in the month of July. Uh, again, in conjunction with PowerDot. Uh, but uh, let me just first ask Johan. I'm, I'm actually curious because I think this goes to the point of, of uh, why, obviously, why we're not having the tour in July. It's now scheduled for August 29th to September 20th. But just briefly on this note, Johan, what is your feeling? Obviously, it feels like at least the media tells us that the, the, the curve, so to speak, in Europe is, is, is flatter and it has passed uh, as opposed to the U S um, what is your bet on whether or not we actually have a tour de France in the month of September? Yeah, I think, I think we're going to have a tour de France. Um, there's obviously, you know, there's a, there's a huge interest of, uh, of France, of, uh, of ASO. They are fighting for their, for their business. Uh, but you know, we have the situation uh, in Europe um, France has been bad. Italy has been bad. Spain has been really bad. But for the moment, I have to say it's getting, you know, you can almost feel it's back to normal. Um, my prediction is that we're going to have a Tour de France. It's the first big event. Um, but I also think that it's going to be very difficult to get to the final of the season. Right. I think the Tour de France is going to be there, you know, with more or less public, um, and by the end, by the end of the Tour de France, we're probably going to see some, some hurdles that uh, are going to be in the way of other, other events like Giro and the Vuelta. Uh, but I'm confident that the Tour de France is going to happen. That's good news. So uh, before we jump into watching, um, first of all, the, the, the prologue, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned, the show is brought to you by PowerDot, as it is almost every year, every episode. Uh, this little gadget right here, I'm telling you, uh, game changer. Uh, you get to be my age, and, and God forbid you get to be George's age and look like he did in that Instagram post the other day. I said, shit, this guy, you know, I'm coming. I look at him. Just look at him. He's looking at him. He's scared. He's looking away. He is looking away. Full disclosure, uh, this is an investment of ours over at Next Ventures. We're very proud of this team. 20% um, off for our listeners. If you go to powerdot.com, type in the buy code, the move. Another cool thing, and this is in speaking with Eric, uh, the founder and CEO a lot. Uh, he's so proud of the work that they do with Feeding San Diego and Feeding America. His wife actually works uh, for Feeding San Diego. And so, uh, not only making a great product that will help us be better athletes 
and, and just recover better and be better, do better, all that better. Um, but giving back and, and you got to love that. So go to power.com, 20% off the buy code, uh, is the move show today. Also brought to you by another, uh, Again, not to keep disclosing another investment that we made, but this is a great, this company right here, Aura. So, um, and if you're watching on video, hopefully you'd see the dope ring I'm wearing. But um, what a progressive and innovative company. The, 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 it is the most accurate sleep tracking device on the market. We know that. Um, wear the ring at night. Uh, I'll wear during the day for an activity track or two, but I don't know if you guys have seen this and, and not go on. I don't know if you caught it over there. So as the NBA rolls out um, here coming up pretty soon at Disneyland or Disney world or one of the Disney's um, everybody in the league will have access to the ring. So not only is it the most accurate sleep tracking device, but its ability to, to uh, detect and to monitor body temp has been proven or at least, I don't want to say proven, but has been certainly uh, um, helpful in almost predicting COVID. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge initiative for them. Go to AuraRing.com. Again, a company we're super proud to be a part of. And uh, Harpreet and his whole team are just crushing it. AuraRing.com. Today's show is also brought to you by Roka. Now, the, the, there's only one problem with Roka because the, I've used that they're my readers. And when, as y'all have followed the show, I've, my readers have gone from one fives to one seven fives. These are two point oh's almost now feel like I got to go stronger, which is just totally depressing. But nonetheless, uh, I love them. Uh, they got the new shade. This is the one I've been just wearing, not just on the road, but the mountain bike as well. The matador uh, and the lens quality is, is top. I mean, this is the top of the biz. So, um, they're totally legit based in Austin, Texas, started by athletes for athletes, um, listeners and viewers of the Mew, the move, that's us, the, not the Mew, the move 25% off at Roka.com. Visit Roka.com slash the move. Get 25% off your first order and enter for the chance to win two pairs of custom matadors. Remember last summer we did the custom their older uh, shade. We did the custom forward ones for the move. We might, we might want to do that in September for the tour, but in the meantime, roca.com slash the move R O K a.com slash the move. Just a little bit of history or a little bit of research that I did on before we um, we'll obviously cover the prologue and then jump into passage de Gaulle. So you'll see in this sliver of road, this is a truly unique piece of road. I mean, it's, it's uh hundreds and hundreds of years old. It's underwater twice a day when the tide rises. So you can just imagine how slippery that is. And the video will, will clearly represent that. But, um, it's, uh, it, it's a freakish thing and they've actually now built a bridge around it. So the road's still there, but we used it in 1999 and, and Johan backed me up here. Um, and the reason we picked this particular stretch of road is honestly, if this stage doesn't happen and these crashes don't happen and we don't get the, the selection in the seven minutes, I honestly don't think any of it happens, which if you think about it, that's a pretty big statement, but I believe that to be true. Do you, JB, the other JB, the boss, JB, what, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we got six minutes there on, on Zula, which finally turned out to be the, the main rival. Um, I'm not, I'm not so sure that to say that nothing, nothing would have happened, but it would have been a very, very different Tour de France because, you know, we had, uh, we had six minutes, uh, after, after stage two on, on basically our main rival. So it would have been a very different race. Um, I still think you would have won because, you know, if you were the strongest in the time trials in the mountains overall that year, but, uh, it would have been very different and a lot more stressful. Mm. Yeah, let's just say that cushion, that six-minute cushion, uh, made it a, a bit more comfortable for our very inexperienced team at the time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we were rookies. We were completely inexperienced, and so you know, having that that advantage already after stage two was made things a lot more comfortable. That's for sure. On that note, I think it'd be really interesting before we jump into the prologue footage 
Uh, let's start with you, Johan. Uh, you know, as as the new director for an American-based team uh, and this unproven Lance Armstrong, uh, what what was it like for you going into this '99 tour, confidence-wise, and and with the whole team and 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 all of your race experience, but also, you know, again as a new director, what did that feel like? Well, it felt it felt great because for me, I was I was living I was living a new dream. Uh, looking back on it now and, and and thinking, okay, what the hell were we thinking back then? You know, I was new. I had no experience as a as a team director. Lance was the first time he was going for GC on 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 purpose when he had he had finished fourth in the Tour of Spain the year before. Um, but still, you know, this was a whole different project. And then the team we had was, you know, completely inexperienced. But I have to say, I don't exactly know the reason, but my gut feeling was that, uh, you know, at the, before the start of the 99 Tour de France, is that I thought we had a good chance to win it. Um, you know, we had planned the whole season around it. A crazy dream, actually, which we all signed up for. And, and we believed in, you know. And uh, I, I, I remember back in, in May of 99, when when we did the recon of certain stages and, and I saw Lance in the Pyrenees riding by himself in the rain for, for a very long time. And then, you know, on another training camp with, uh, with some of the other climbers, I, we were quite confident actually, you know, crazy to think about it, but I, I definitely thought we were one of the, one of the favorites. And then next, and uh, I, I want to hear from George, what, what your thoughts were going into this 99 tour. I mean, Everyone who watched all, all seven of those tours know what a, what a workhorse you are and what a great teammate you are. But, and you and Lance go back to being teenagers, uh, first getting to know each other. What was your mindset going into it to, uh, uh, in confidence in Lance and all this effort? Well, I mean, like we mentioned earlier, we were super inexperienced uh, at that sort of role at the Tour de France. And, Back in those days, I still had sort of my sprinter ambitions that uh, Johan let me uh, go for some of the sprints early on that first 10 days of the race. Uh, so I had some personal ambition there as well. But of course, my relationship with Lance had gone way back uh, at that moment. And he knew that I was going to be there for him uh, no matter what, and that I could play a pivotal role in those really stressful selection stages like the Passage de Gua. Uh, so there was no question of how well we'd work together. The question was, can we pull it off? And then the you, Lance. News, we were the bad news bears, baby. <laughs> I mean, you, you should have seen this, this, this piece of shit camper. We drove around. <laughs> what do we call that thing? Um, oh, God. We, you know, of course. Chitty, it, chitty, bang, bang. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. We would sit every morning and chitty, chitty, bang, bang with the damn Mayo Jean going, well, shit, what? <laughs> Is this happening? We in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and we going to whatever. Let's just we'll fake it till we make it. By the it. way, by the way, your camper was a lot nicer than mine. We had two campers and mine was even more ghetto than yours. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't even think we let's, have air conditioner now. Again, before, before we roll the, the prologue footage, and I do want to hear from you, Lance, because I, I don't. I don't recall what you did leading up to that tour. Uh, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the one week races and things like that. I don't know what you did and what those results were, were, and were you on people's radar as a GC contender? Oh, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I may be on some of the, the long, long, long list. I mean, I, I got, as we showed in the spring, you know, I was second at Amstel gold race. I felt like my form was coming up. We had done all this recon. Um, I did the Dolphine, uh, which, you know, was not, um, a, nothing spectacular, did route to Sud and, um, but just came in, but did, most importantly, I, it, we timed it just perfectly. You know, I felt recovered. I felt healthy. I felt light, I felt strong. Um, I, I did have, um, I guess the most significant thing as I had, or the most, at least in my mind was I, I had set the record just before that on the Col de la Madon, which has become sort of this mythical place in the South of France where everybody goes to test their climbing speed and time. So I knew I was climbing well, I knew I was right where I needed to be there, but, but that doesn't, you know, this is, this is bike racing and, and bike and bike races like the Tour de France are not, um, they're not marathons. They're, you know, they're a bunch of 
things combined between NASCAR and chess and politics. And I talk about it all the time, but you'll see right here. I mean, this is a guy, as we jump into the prologue, this is uh, I'm, after that day, by the way, my average heart rate that day was about 201. <sighs> Absolutely through the roof. And I was just, and I didn't even feel it. Um, and so um, let's, let's jump into the prologue. You'll see then, and then, and then we'll roll into passage de Guay and then ultimately uh, that final or the first TT. Johan, do you recall, and just remind me, what was it? How many kilometers was this exactly? Um, I think it was eight or nine kilometers. Yeah, I think it was nine kilometers. Nine K. You know, it's funny for me, like this is the first time that, that everybody sort of noticed or, or, or at least started writing about the cadence. Although you see here, Abraham Milano with a, also an extremely high cadence, but uh, everybody was sort of enamored with the cadence. Look, this is, so here we come in, you know, Alano coming into this hard right-hander. And this was the one climb yeah. of the prologue, which um, we, I, think, I, don't, I don't know if you remember, Johan, we had this debate of, do you keep it in the big chain ring or do you risk going to the small chain ring, which sounds simple. I mean, we all switch all the time, but when you're under full force, if you miss it or that chain drops, I mean, <laughs> it's over especially yeah. on a climb. Speaking about that lens, I don't know if you remember doing the, the recon, you were trying to figure that out. Small chain and big chain ring, you were looking down and one of the team cars was right in front of you. And I, it, it kind of pulled out and right, and right in front of your line. You weren't looking at it. I, I yelled at you to heads up. And I think you clipped the, the mirror of the car. <laughs> Could have gone yeah. a much different way. Yeah, telecom, see? It was the telecom team. I mean, they, they, they were out to get us the whole time. It started before anybody knew. Another big rival coming through, Alex Zula, obviously time trial god, time trial specialist. Our good friend, Mr. Julik, Bobby J coming up. He was one of the favorites because, you know, he finished third the year before. And right. second and, and first were not there, so he was wearing number one. Yes, had the number one on. Had the same bike as you had, Lance, which, uh, by the way, we should talk about that bike. Um, yep. Bobby and I went to go visit Lightspeed two years ago when we had the, uh, the Grand Fundo in Chattanooga, and they told us a funny story about how that whole process worked out. Oh, I haven't, this is uh, Inquiring Minds Want to Know. I've never heard this. Chris <laughs> Boardman coming across the line. Yeah, so Boardman had won the prologue the year before here, and, and, and Julek was second. So Meter Julik and Bortman was split up three finally. And, uh, and here comes the guy that nobody thought could time trial. Look at the cadence. <laughs> Eight seconds up on Zula. And watch this. Yes. You, I heard enough. I mean, obviously it's in French, but I heard enough to know that I just set the best time. And I was like, fuck, yeah. That's exactly what I thought, in fact. Well, it's clearly not 9K because it's only eight minute time trial. So I think we're a little bit off on the distance. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Last little hairpan for Bobby J. Um, tell us while we're seeing, looking at, so George, I'm, I'm super curious. What was the story coming out of light speed? You know, the bike, of course, our bike says <laughs> track. It was not a track. Um, shocker. Um, what did they tell you? So we went there and they showed us they actually still had the design specs for both of you guys' bikes. But Bobby, being a favorite of the Tour de France that year, uh, I think you both put in a request at the same time. Bobby at the time was on MBK bikes. Obviously, we were on our trek. Um, but they had to make a decision on whose bike was going to get done first. So they went with Bobby's bike being done first because he was the favorite of the Tour de France. And obviously, you were a bit of a newcomer. Your bike was a bit late, apparently, That's, but it made it in time. Who's can, can I just? Who was that young guy right there? Did you see <laughs> young the last hug? <laughs> this is why. This is why I love that y'all listen. But you have to watch these. There was a really young. By the way, too. Look at the skin suit. Look how wow, not look arrow. At, look at all of the drag on that skin wow. suit. I mean, amazing how wow. these things. The times have changed, and and uh, we all look different, of course. Um, but yeah, there it is right there. Seven seconds down, Zula, 11, Olano, Moreau, 15, Boardman, 16. That was, that's what set us up. Um, and I think for, gosh, for me at that point, it was, it was, uh, surreal. I didn't really know, um, how to react. 
and obviously it set the stage for years and years and years of this to come. But um, man, what a day. Since uh, Johan seems to remember everything, unlike yep. the rest of us, do you remember what the conversation was like uh, in the uh, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? <laughs> oh, it, <laughs> or at dinner that night? It was yeah. euphoric, completely was, euphoric. No, I mean, it was the first, uh, the first uh, yellow jersey, you know, and, and it's like the first piece of a puzzle. You know, it's only the prologue, you know, but uh, we obviously had this plan to go for the tour and... <laughs> We, our preparation was perfect and, you know, winning the prologue, uh, having the first yellow jersey, it was kind of, okay, you know, we're here, we're ready, and we thought we were ready, and now we know that we're ready. Right? So, uh, no, it was, it was amazing. It was an amazing moment. I think it's, it's, a, it's a very, very important moment. Uh, the prologue of the 1990 Tour de France is, is one of the most important uh, moments of those seven years. But, Johan, it was also, and this is why we wanted to show the prologue Passage de Gaulle we had to show just because it was so, so significant for so many reasons. We wanted to show the time trial because it was it, there were these I mean, people watched the prologue and they were like, OK, you know, he had a good day. He's in the yellow jersey, the cancer kid. And then Passage de Gaulle happens and then we get the big t- chunk of time and they go, OK, they got kind of lucky. They were at the front. There was a big crash. And then but every, I think in everybody's minds, they were like, well, we'll get to the time trial and he'll lose the Jersey or they won't be able to get the Jersey in the time trial. Yeah. Uh, well, and then, and then we got to Sestrier and they said, well, okay. And they kept saying, yes, but yes, but, yeah. and you know, we got to Sestrier and they were like, yeah, but he can't climb. He'll lose it in, in the mountains. And so that was what was cool to me. It was like, okay, well let's go do a time trial. All right, well, yeah. let's go finish uphill at Sestrier. It was step by step. You know, we, we, yeah. did step by step. we know, we knew that you were ready. But, you know, you had never proven it in, in, in such a big race. And so, you know, we, I, I do remember, yeah, the prologue, okay. Then the luck of Passage de Bois, the time trial. And, but then after the time trial, was okay. You know, this is it now for them. You know, he can't climb. Uh, now the mountains start. And then, you know, we all, we all know what happened in Sestriere. So it was, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. And by the way, um, let me just uh, say this, because as Johan just said, we all know what happened at Sestriere. But we also all know what happened. Right? We're not sitting here um, trying to disregard or disrespect or not remember anybody's feelings, emotions, memories about this time in cycling. So uh, w- we love our memories. We cherish our memories. We, we think a lot of other folks do too, but we also have both feet on the ground. And I just want to say this, um, uh, you know, we, we know what happened. And so um, for those still here and for those listening or watching, fucking a we love you and we appreciate you um but we're aware and so we're not trying to throw this in anybody's face um but i i, I don't even i don't even plan to say that but yawn you just you just reminded me to say it i don't know somehow but mm-hmm. um so thank but you it, all but it's but it's funny to, funny you say that because you know if you if you look at the original footage uh of the prologue you see alex zula coming in you know he was on on banesto that year that second in the prologue, and he just came back from a suspension of eight months because he was on Festina before and he had admitted to taking performance enhancing drugs. But yet, you know, it, he was second in that Tour de France, and no, nobody has ever talked about Alex Zula in a bad way anymore. So, well, Johan, you know, the, the, let's not let's not go down that road. Alex Zula didn't win seven tours, so if he had, they would have talked about him in that way. But, but but just to say, you know, we have to acknowledge, of course, the the, the period of cycling, uh, the the era of the of cycling then. But you know, let's let's just face it. You know, it was it was what it was back then. Right. Well, that's yes, maybe. I mean, it it it, it was messy, as as you know, as we say. Hey, let's. Um, we can acknowledge the 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 inconsistencies of the way it was reported as well. <laughs> Well, yeah. But again, hey, uh, I don't know if anybody noticed, by the way, but if you see right there, you see that thing back there? See that little cup, a little blue cup on the, on the mantle? There's seven of those here. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it was weird. Nobody ever came to get them. So I just got them. I keep them. <laughs> so that's the difference. Hey, today's show is also brought to you by Ventum. 
Ventum is a premium bike brand. I've been riding the 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 frame lately. It's 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 actually damn impressive. Started uh, more as a tri brand uh, with a tri specific bike that looked a little like the old. Uh, speaking of old footage, looked like the old Lotus. Direct to consumer, prioritizes pre and post sale customer experience, full money back guarantee. It is the official global bike partner of Ironman. Um, but this new Road Whip that I've been riding is uh, uh, I gotta tell you super light very stiff responsive i've been digging it uh and it's by the way it's got this new um or it's got a like a custom we do paint job which is just so sick uh the bikes are designed from the ground up assembled in the u.s shipped from the uh, headquarters in utah and it could it comes in like a specially engineered box so it's pretty easy uh the road frame is called the ns1 uh, for 20 percent off for our customers, and we'll sh- and then we we took a bunch of photos yesterday, so you'll see pics of of my Ventum. Twenty uh, percent off. Go to ventumracing dot com slash the move. Twenty percent off, and we'll show you pics. Today's show is also brought to you by Kyoku. K Y O K U. Fun little tidbit: Kyoku is uh, is Japanese for for song or melody. Uh, Kyoku is basically your very own personalized recovery drink. We all know, you know, doing events like the Tour de France, other hard rides, recovery is key. Without recovery, you know, the next day is just not the same. Um, allows you to train harder, improve faster, beat your PRs. I'll get to the PRs in just a second. I uh, came across these couple CrossFit dudes who were just obsessed with biohacking their performance. Uh, they had really gotten into cycling. Um, so they came up with this system where if you go to kyoku.com, hit the get started tab, you fill out a very short free questionnaire, a little bit about you, what you're into, uh, your skill level, performance level, their algorithm cross references, um, your input and ultimately comes up with your personalized pack of recovery drink. Uh, to get started, go to Kyoku, K-Y-O-K-U dot com. The buy code for us is the move, all one word, 20% off. Also very cool. Um, if you don't set a PR in 30 days, you get your money back. What's to lose? We all want to improve. We all want to recover. We want to be better. Go in. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Kyoku dot com. 30 days. If it doesn't work, send it back. And the other thing I really dig is uh, these guys are into giving back. You know, I've always been a fan of, uh, of doing good, giving back, paying it forward. Uh, they partnered with 1% for the Planet, um, which uh, amazing organization uh, protects the land, forests, rivers, oceans, and also encourages sustainable methods of energy production. 1% of revenue from Kyoku goes to 1% for the Planet, kyoku.com. Let's jump into uh, stage two, Passage de Gua, which, as I touched on earlier, really historical piece of pavement. Uh, <laughs> they've only done it once like this. And by the way, this was well into the stage. I think a few years back, they started over the Passage de Gua. They actually have a foot race over it. But to say that this thing is, quote unquote, slimy is an understatement. This thing is, and we'll see at the beginning of this cut, is straight up underwater. So it just never really dries out. And, the, and, and just being in the field that day and the anxiety around, got to be at the front, got to be at the front. I mean, if you think about a crosswind section or a cobblestone section, I mean, you have to be at the front, but this is like next level have to be at the front. And as you see it unfold and you see the crashes take place and people that are literally in the ocean, I mean, there are people, I mean, this, this goob, Jonathan Vauders, ends up in the ocean or the sand or whatever, what, the marsh or whatever that shit is. I mean, it is just epic. Let's, let's do it. I can't wait. We got six minutes of this. Yeah, just, just before we start seeing the footage, you know, I think, of course, we, for us, it was, it was a good day because we actually cemented kind of the victory there. Uh, but looking back at it now, it's actually, I mean, it's crazy that an organizer puts a section of that in such a big race because, you know, you said two times, a, a few times a day underwater, it's actually only four hours per day that people can go over it. 20 hours, it's covered by water. And it's not... Well, 
I, I think they should do it every year. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's. Uh, oh, know, I did, wait a minute. All right, wait a minute. Are you getting soft in your old age? It was good for us, but I think it's not. It's not. It's not justified. This is unbelievable. It's a lot worse than <laughs> having sections of Paris Bay or this is. This is. Are you, you know. Are you, Beforehand, that there's going to be accidents. Are you channeling your inner George Hincapie, the I mean, sensitive side that says this isn't right, this is hey, just not fair, hey, this isn't nice? Easy, easy. that same George Hincapie got you to the front on that section out of trouble, <laughs> as we'll soon see in the footage. Oh snap! Let's roll it. So as we see, I mean, right out of the gate, here is the road. I mean, there was a road. It started and now it's gone. This is the Passage du Gua. <laughs> like, this is where you have to go. <laughs> I mean, believe me, the, look at this. I mean, the horse and the buggy. And <laughs> look at this poor guy. So this is where, and, and, and now that you watch sort of clips like this, you know, Johan, you might have a point. It was just so, um, so, okay. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, wow. Honey, have you seen the the white Peugeot anywhere? <laughs> and look at this. Oh my gosh! And again, it's just it's the sides are just um, just marshy, goofy. There's the new bridge. So this was built in in the modern era, but you know, 300 years ago, I think the road was it goes back centuries and centuries. But uh, and every by the way, it's no these are no these aren't secrets, right? Everybody knows Passage de Gua underwater 20 hours a day, super slippery, got to be at the front, uh, crosswind, everybody knows. So it's not like, I mean, I think you guys are aware, but it's not like anybody gets taken by surprise here. But just, oh. again, key point, have to be at the front. And my man to my right over in green, but look at the boat. Look at that. <laughs> the boat just sitting out there. <laughs> um, and the flag, look at the flag on the boat. That indicates that wind was whipping. And here it just, the shit hits the fan. Not for me, because my man, Hincapie, had me at the front. We were at the front. We knew it was coming. It's basically, uh, you're getting ready for war. And we had, you know, at the time, Ekimov, uh, Frankie, I believe, was up there. We had, a, we had a hit squad for that type of a selection process. So we, we came in with some confidence, but although uh, very, it was a very stressful day, that's for sure. And again, the footage is kind of old. You sort of start to bottom left of the screen. You see where the crash starts. And then, you know, like most crashes in bike racing, it's just dominoes, but people off into the marsh um, and just sliding forever. And here, uh, here's the front of the group. And it's just one of those things. If you're, if you're strong enough and, and sort of lucky enough to be at the front, you make the selection. You don't even know there's a crash. I don't think we knew there I am in, in the yellow jersey. You don't even know until the end where Yohan says big crash. And you, and, and I think at one point, there's only 10 of us in that first group. It ended up yeah. being bigger, but mm -hmm. only 10 people made that selection. Uh, yeah. And that's, you know, that's, there's not much luck involved in that. It's how, how, how far in the front you hit that, that first uh, right hand turn onto the section. Everybody knew there was going to be carnage, but these guys fought the hardest to be in the front. And you just don't, and I think your mentality at that point is like, okay, we have a selection. We'll probably regroup or everybody gets caught. You don't know that this group is going to end up getting six plus minutes. I mean, it's, it's, you just think right there, you think you're staying out of trouble. It's funny you say that I went for a ride with Bobby Julek and Bobby was not in his first 10 guys, but he comes in later on with about when the group was 30 to 50 and Bobby being the favorite, being a, one of our old boys that we grew up racing with, I went back. I don't know if we talked about it on the radio, but I'm like, at the time, I still had my New York accent. I'm like, hey, Bobby, get some of your boys and help us out here. Huh? We got Zula in the back. Big opportunity <laughs> for us. So Bobby <laughs> brings up three of his co these guys, and we all start working together for one mission, putting time on Zula. <laughs> yeah, well, that the, worked. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's amazing if you see, like, here, uh, this is a, the, a bridge after the Passage de Bois, and the group of Zula was uh, only 30, 40 seconds behind. You know, So it's not like they lost six minutes on the Passage du Bois. I mean, you know, our group was obviously pulling very strong. And after a while, I think we had like three or four guys there with, uh, and here's, here's Zula with his team. You know, there's Tricky Beltran also, who was a teammate of us afterwards. Amazing. This is Ivan Gotti. Who Gatti, had the, Ivan you know, Gotti. He won the Giro in 99. So, uh, and here, this is the lead out for the sprint already. 
Significant day. I mean, as I said at the top of the show, you could argue that without this day, none of it happens. Um, but uh, yeah, quite amazing. Fellas, should we wrap it up with a little, <clears throat> a little time trial action in Mets? It's not, um, we added this just, just uh, JB and I actually added it yesterday just because it felt like, as I said, I mentioned a second ago, people just kept saying, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, but this was the next, yeah, but like nobody thought that this was going to happen. By the way, my two minute man in front of me was Abraham Alano, who we saw on the prologue was wearing the world time trial champion skin suit. Um, this was another yeah, but. So here we jump ahead uh, to, to the time trial in Mets. So as you'll see, I'm, I am not in the yellow jersey. Jan Kersipu actually had uh, the yellow jersey on. Uh, but this was a big, this was, this was a big day. I, I, I you know, personally felt like I was ready. Um, also mentally and, and probably thought that, uh, who knows, look at the cadence. I mean, this is, again, this is that time where, People are like, what's with the cadence? It was just such a revelation for people. Very tricky technical course, not flat, beautiful part of France. Um, this is, that's where, George, correct me if I'm wrong, is that where Bobby had crashed? Yeah, I think he, I think, I think he might have broken his wrist in this, in this time trial. Yeah, I believe um, that was right, right at that moment. He, he actually said at the top of that climb where you said it was kind of a, you know, very technical uh, time trial, there was a, there was a big climb. He was a, about a minute down on you. It was in eighth place. And he had done the time trial, knew it pretty well. So he's like, I, I need to make up as much time as I can on this downhill. Ended up breaking his wrist in mm. a time trial. Mm. But you also knew it pretty well also. I mean, I think you and Johan had gone earlier in the year, um, had done the recon. So I think you were pretty confident on how quickly you can take all the corners, which, you know, at the time, not many, not many of the favorites were doing the recon as you and Johan did that year which now has become kind of a standard for the Tour de France favorites, but you obviously knew the time trial really well. And I just got to say, I mean, I don't think it, it, under any circumstance that Abraham Milano expect uh, for number 181 to come by him, catch him and pass him in the time trial. And uh, I can't lie. I it felt, I felt pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> That was good watching fan. for us. I, yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. That was when we were like, oh. expect. we were like, yeah. oh shit. Now oh, we're going so in the go. mountains gotta, with the Jersey. Yeah, of course, the had, to do, had to do the short adjustment there. <laughs> <laughs> but look at Zula's time. 109.34. So we come in almost a minute quicker. And, it, and this is truly where we're sort of like, oh boy, now this just got real. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you look, if you look that that minute, that minute basically is the difference between you and Zula because afterwards in the mountains it was kind of, you know, you took some time on Zula, then he took some time back at one point. Uh, so that minute is basically uh, the difference in, in in the in the end result if you take away the six minutes of passage to Guam. Yeah, no, that 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 was that's right. I mean, if you go back and of course everybody can go back in Paris and say yes, but yes, but. We're not, none of us on this show, we're ever fans of yes, buts or yeah, buts or excuses or whiners, but you can subtract it all and go, damn, this would have been a different bike race. Mm -hmm. For sure. But that's why I said, I mean, that's why it's, it's not a marathon. It's not the hundred meter freestyle. I mean, it's, it's, it's racing and it's got elbows and it's got wind and it's got positioning and it's got, this is all the things that make our sport beautiful. And, um, yeah, I mean this sort of. Well, if you if you if you think back, I mean that, that time trial, Lance. We, uh, you know, the, the day that the night uh, of Amstel Gold Race, which is you know somewhere end of April, we drove to Metz, and we went to preview that time trial already in, in April, and then we, after that, we went to the, the Pyrenees to, to to preview, preview some of the Pyrenees stages, which was you know a first for you and a, and a first for the team, and, and actually a first for basically a lot of teams because all the other teams just went on racing and, and finished the classic season. And we were already focused on, uh, on the Tour de France at the end of April. Yeah. yeah. I th you know what I think is important. You mentioned in all these firsts, it, it also was a first for the American fans. 
you know, there, there was the Le Monde era, but when that happened, we didn't get daily coverage. We didn't get to see an entire stage. We didn't understand racing. And, you know, back in the U S people are going, Holy shit. There's, there's an American leading the tour de France. There's an American team in the tour de France. Uh, and there were watching parties happening at bars. We were talking about it. I was on the radio. We're talking about it every day. It was, it was exploding everywhere and, and, and bars were filling up to watch mountain stages at, you know, 8 a.m., uh, which is wild. It was, but it was so, it was so new uh, and no one really understood. I don't, we still struggle, right? <laughs> we didn't understand the sport and all these dynamics, but it, it was such a new phenomenon and so exciting. And it, it's hard to even describe what it was like for, uh, you know, cycling. For, well, they were Lance fans. They weren't even necessarily cycling fans. Uh, there were the cycling fans, but it was just this whole but, new thing to get behind. Well, you know who didn't know, JB, is, was we didn't know. Right. We, we were over there and George backed me up. I mean, we had no idea that this was going on over here in the U S and that there was this interest in, in, in this momentum building and all of these things you just talked about. We, we were over there in the middle of this, this tough ass roaming bike race circus and we had no idea. Right. And so now to hear, you know, look back on it 20 plus years and, um, it's just wild and it's cool. It's cool to know that that was going up. We had no idea. We just thought we were riding around and everybody in, in, in America was getting ready for college football. That's what we thought. <laughs> <clears throat> I agree. And that, that, that might've been helpful because had we known the hysteria that was going on, we might've even been gotten more distracted. At least we were able to really try to focus into the unknown and try to accomplish something that we had no idea we could uh, ever pull off. Yeah. Do you guys remember what it was like coming back home after that? Coming back to the U.S. in the oh, winter? Yeah. Were you? I mean, I mean, it had to have been surreal. I don't think any of it had set in for for at least for me for quite some time. You know, and I mean years and years and years, right? Which isn't good. I mean, it might have been better if it had set in a little bit, and we'd have realized the position we held, the significance it held. You just said it, JB. People sitting around at bars having watch parties. Yeah. They bought in. They invested. They believed. And, um, you know, that perspective might have been a little, a little better for all of us. But with that, <clears throat> let's wrap up today. This is the best of the blue train. This is just day one. We got six more of these. We're going to go through, and you guys can all sit here and in your mind, think of the, we know the days, right? Is it, is it Alptuez 01? Is it Alptuez 04? Is it riding through the field? Is it, you know, hitting the kids? You know, you know the days. And so um, this is going to be fun for us to go relive. Uh, we appreciate you all tuning in uh, to my fellow friends all over the place, socially distanced from my weird ass here in Colorado, J.B. Hager, George Incapi, Johan Bernil. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for supporting this show, uh, all the advertisers. And uh, we look forward. We got six more. We'll fill up this month. And then uh, look forward to covering the tour uh, in September. <laughs>